and the Romans are not done for us. Hello and thanks for downloading. My name's Neil and you're listening to the Ancient History Hound podcast. In this episode, I'm continuing with the Roman kings and I'll be chatting about Lucius Tarquinius Priscus, Rome's fifth king. If you've listened to my other Roman kings podcast, you'll understand how I approach both the source material and the general narrative when it comes to the regal period at Rome. It's a combination of weighing the story critically enjoying the story as just that, and trying to understand what the historians, mainly Livy and Dionysus of Halicarnassus, are trying to tell us about Rome. This is especially relevant when in examining Lucius, because there's a real sense of tying him into the physical history of Rome. With Lucius, there are some overlapping narratives which deal with his successor, and just to keep things neat and save some good stories, I'm going to leave these till the podcast on the next king. So indulge me a moment while I recount a bit of his backstory. The tale of how he came to be takes us not only back before Lucius was born, but also out of Rome and even Italy. Instead, I need to begin in one of the Greek city-states, Corinth, in the early part of the 7th century BCE. At this time, there's a ruling family there called the Bacchiade, which formed an oligarchy. One of them, a woman called Labda, married outside the extended family, and she bore a child. Now, there had been an oracle from Delphi during the rounds which suggested that time would be up for the Bacchiade, but it wasn't tied to anything or anyone in particular. And the chances are, it wasn't exactly news. As a ruling family, it's more than likely they had their fair share of enemies around them. However, around the time of, of Labda giving birth, a new oracle was sourced, and this stated in no mean terms that Labda's child was going to bring justice to the rulers of Corinth. The Bacchiade responded to this in the way you might expect, well, at least in traditional terms. They sent men to kill the child, and when they arrived at Labda's house, they found themselves just unable to do the deed. Each time one of them picked up the infant, its smile just won them over. After a while, the men took themselves outside the house to regroup and refocus on what they'd been told to do. In the meantime, Labda saw her chance, and she hid the child in a chest, and that's where her infant... Sipselus got his name from. When the men returned, they searched in vain for the child, presumably avoiding the baby-sized chest in the middle of the room. But let's not unsuspend our disbeliefs here, because Sipselus grew to manhood and lived up to the oracle. He managed to seize power from the Bacchiade and set himself up as tyrant of Corinth. As you might expect, this sort of political upheaval had consequences. A Corinthian citizen called Demaratus decided that it might be best to leave at this point. And this was probably a good idea, given that, according to Dionysus, he was both a member of the Bacchiade and had built up a sizable wealth from his trading ventures. And this, after all, would have made him choice pickings for a new tyrant such as Sipselus. Demaratus had good connections with a city in Etruria called Tarquinia. I've spoken about Etruria and the Etruscans in the previous episodes on the Roman kings. In short, Etruria was a collection of city-states to the north of Rome, some of which, such as Vei and Fidne, had been in conflicts with it. The Etruscan cities were rich, and the link with Corinth is thoroughly plausible, given that they imported Greek pottery and other Greek goods. And in case you wondered, Tarquinia is northwest of Rome, near the coast. On a map, it's around 70 kilometres, 45 miles, as the crow flies. Demaratus did well in Tarquinia. He settled down and had two sons, one called Arons and the other called Lucomo. Sadly, Arons died, leaving Lucomo to inherit, which he did. Lucomo also went on to marry a woman there called Tanaquil. Tanaquil is a fascinating character, and her influence will be felt in the events of this podcast and that of the following king. So make sure you keep a note of her name, and in fairness, I probably won't even forget her anyway. What you should immediately know about Tanaquil was that she was highly driven and a member of the elite family of Tarquinia, or one of the elite families. Livy painted her as someone who wasn't going to settle for a comfortable existence in Tarquinia, which was ultimately boxed in by her husband's non-elite status. Rome offered a perfect opportunity for someone looking to make good, and Livy pins the whole moving to Rome project on her. Dionysus isn't as direct in this, but he does imply that it's her in the background, and it forms something of an ongoing motif of their relationship. Tanaquil isn't a Roman matron operating in the background. 
she's comfortable taking control and stepping out from the shadows. The couple made their way to Rome with plenty of coin and a household to support them there. As they sat resting near the Janiculum Hill, an eagle swooped down and stole Lucomo's cap before returning it. Tanical immediately understood the event as a sign that Lucomo would rise to power, and this is something which became an association that Etruscans had, that they were invariably good at reading omens. In her book, The Etruscans, Dr Lucy Shipley neatly points out how this was something of a stereotype, particularly with Etruscan women. The involvement of a portent involving a bird also harks back to a much earlier incident in Rome's history. You might remember that Romulus and Remus decided who would name and found the city based on counting birds in the sky from their respective hills. There's also a less specific and feathery association at play here. Much like the twins before him, here is a newcomer to Rome being given a divine thumbs up. It's also an opportunity to give some insight to Tanaquil and establish her character. And there's even a mild comedic hum in the background. After all, who doesn't like animals misbehaving? You may have already guessed by this point that Lucomo is also Lucius Tarquinius Priscus. Rebrands, you see, aren't a new thing. Lucomo, after settling in Rome, changed his name. And the reason for changing his name? Well, it's not exactly obvious. And I wondered whether it was because he wanted a fresh start or was it a strategy to make himself seem more Roman? But neither seemed that compelling particularly the latter, given how, when he arrived in Rome, he spent much of his time building relationships with leading figures and also making himself popular with the masses. It can't have been possible to hide who you were and where you came from when employing such an aggressive PR campaign. Lucius, and that's what I'll call him from now on, played the political game perfectly. A good example of this is how he ensured that the current king, Ancus, didn't see him as a threat. A stranger arriving and dripping with coin who then woos both the elite and common alike is pretty much the nightmare of any ruler, but Lucius made a large amount of his wealth available to the king, and thus the state. It was a savvy way of bribing favour without actually using a bribe. Though in fairness, this is Roman politics, so it wouldn't be the first. The makeover from the non-too-ambitious Lucomo to the highly skilled political operator wasn't a happy accident. As I mentioned earlier, Tanaquil was the driving change against a very comfortable but dull life in Tarquinia. She was as canny in her understanding of in the divine as she was in the mortal. But don't just take my word for it. A fragment of Polybius described her as admirably suited by nature to assist in any political enterprise. And the sense we get from the sources is that Tanaquil was the brains behind pretty much everything he did. Lucius soon rose into a position of prominence with the king, becoming an advisor and sounding board. So when Ancus died around 616 BCE, Lucius was well placed to take the next step, though he'd still need to go through the process of election. That Rome elected its kings is still something I can't quite get my head around, assuming that they ever did, and this is not just another instance of the much later historians creating Roman history. Up until now, the commentary about the election by the sources has been minimal, but Livy makes a very revealing comment when he wrote that Lucius was the first to have actively canvassed for the throne. Just to remind you in case it's all new, what we know up until this point is vague, but seems to have been that the Senate, as the body, would choose a candidate and then the people would validate or verify him by voting on them. To canvass for a vote implies that you have an electorate who might choose others, though it could also mean that your only choice but need to make sure that you've got the citizens on your side. A good example of this is the episode I did on Tullus when I spoke about how the king had immediately made some of his own land available to the poor, and this might have been a pre-election or canvassing, as it were, pledge to the masses to make sure that he was chosen. Though Livy made the canvassing comments specifically the time of the death of Ancus, it's more than reasonable to read all of Lucius's actions up until this point as canvassing. He'd made, after all, himself popular with the elite and the commoners, and both of these were required if you wanted to sit on the throne. With all of this, you might think that Lucius had it all neatly lined up. Not so. There was a threat to his ambition, and it came in the form of Angus's sons, who presumably felt that they were owed the throne, or that one of them would be easily elected, or was the right choice 
Before I go further, there is some irony to be enjoyed here. If you listen to my podcast on Anchors, you'll know the story of how he came to rule. Suffice to say, either by murder and political opportunism, or by a divine act which he wasn't involved with. The former involved Anchors spreading rumours that the then king was about to set up a dynasty, which is very similar to what is sort of going on now, with the sons of Anchors looking to seize the throne or take it through an election. In any case, the sons of Ancus were apparently sent away or lured out of Rome on a hunting trip, so Lucius had no rivals in whichever way the election was formed or no one of any great worth. The sons of Ancus are given here as a threat to Lucius, but the way that they're dealt with doesn't make much sense, even with your disbelief set to suspended. My own thought is that a later event which involved the sons of Ancus needed a cause so keep this in mind for later on, because they'll be back. OK then, here we are at the beginning of the reign of Lucius Tarquinius Priscus, Rome's fifth king. The year is 616 or 617 BCE, and many of you already know that there were seven kings of Rome, meaning that if the regal period of Rome was a horror film involving a possessed child, it would be about this point that the parents find that sinister picture the kid drew of a magical friend of his, only to throw it in the bin. But none of this seems to be Lucius's fault. He doesn't agitate anything which ensures the later demise of the monarchy at Rome, at least not really directly. In fact, his reign is the first in which a number of iconic Roman elements, from what Romans wore to physical structures, are directly mentioned. And even though it's the later sources attributing these things to him, there is a case that these elements and aspects were either imported or built around the time he was on the throne. Before I get to these, I need to briefly cover what has become a common theme amongst Roman kings, numera part, that is, fighting with the neighbours. Both Livy and Dionysus recount the victories of Lucius with some aplomb. In a series of battles, he subdued the Latin people by defeating its main cities. Dionysus suggested this initially started because one of the Latin cities called Apiole had been in a truce with Rome, and when Ancus died, they considered it void. This raises an interesting point and gives a rationale for why it always seems to kick off when a new king comes in. In truth, there are a number of reasons for a new king declaring war. The need for prestige, keeping the mob angry at someone else, as just two examples. But we can also throw in the notion of treaties being fixed to a king and a person, not the Roman state. So when that king dies, so does a truce. Not just done with the Latins, he also took on the Sabines, as well as the Etruscans. You might think that with his Etruscan roots fighting with Etruscan cities would be a difficult thing for him. Perhaps so, but remember that Etruscan city-states, much like the Greek city-states, weren't a homogenous, friendly bunch. They were often sparring and at war with each other. Dionysus noted that in the defeat of the Etruscans, it didn't result in a garrison being brought in or dismantling of any city. And this had occurred when previous kings had won successes over cities previously, the most perhaps famous example being Alba Longa. And this makes sense, both from a historical perspective and a practical one. In the case of the former, Etruria was a continual thorn in Rome's side for centuries after the regal period. It's likely that readers of Dionysus would know this or remember it, and ask the obvious question, what happened, I thought, Rome had seen off the Etruscans, so why, why do I remember them being a problem a few centuries ago? In the context of practicality, there was no way Rome could garrison the cities involved, and making out that they did, well, that would be stretching things a bit too far. A positive for him as well would be to show how powerful and strong Lucius had been. He wasn't about to sack or destroy cities, because he could just demand obedience. During the talks with the Etruscan ambassadors, Dionysus mentioned that they brought him a few items to cement their new agreement with him. And these were a crown of gold, nice, ivory throne, mm, scepter with a golden eagle, definitely, and an embroidered purple robe, which was cut to a semicircular shape. Dionysus wrote that the Greeks called it the Tabena, and the Romans, the Toga that it was specifically Lucius who introduced the toga as part of a peace settlement is an incredibly detailed origin story for this famous garment. It's more plausible that it was known about, and under an Etruscan king, an Etruscan form of dress was adopted. Just imagine if Lucius hadn't been king, and all those university and college parties which had to use the Greek himation instead. <laughs> 
And it might not even have been Lucius who brought the toga to bear on the Roman people, because Tanaquil, her again, was associated with a number of garments. As Gretchen Myers points out in her Companion to the Etruscans, these included the different togas, for example, both the toga Prectexta and the toga recta. The first one was worn by elite male youths, and the latter worn when they went through youth into adulthood. Pliny wrote that a toga made for the next king after Lucius, presumably by Tanaquil, was held in the temple of Fortuna, and Tanaquil's spindle was held in the temple of Sancus. There was one other side effect to all of this warring. After defeating Apiole, who I mentioned at the beginning, he celebrated in grand fashion, having secured more loot than he'd expected, and if you're going to party, then you need a good venue. And that's where the Circus Maximus comes in. Dionysus wrote that the Circus Maximus was one of the most beautiful and admirable structures in Rome. And by the time he was writing the early imperial period, it would be difficult to argue against this. The Circus was a long track of around 2,000 feet, that's 600 or so metres, which had turning points at each end. It had sweeping architecture which allowed the seating of possibly 150,000 people, Lavish games were held there, including gladiatorial contests and all sorts of shows. If you're thinking, what about the Colosseum? Well, this wasn't fully built until 80 CE. For much of Rome's history, the circus was the place where it all happened. Perhaps the strongest association the Circus Maximus has, and still does to this day, is with chariot racing. It was a racetrack after all, and I reckon even by now you're thinking of Ben-Hur. But all of this was when the circus had been improved and upgraded a number of times over the centuries. What I'm going to talk about is how it came to be, and what it may have looked like at the outset. The site of the circus is in a valley between the Palatine and Aventine hills. As with much of early Rome, anything at the bottom of a hill or in a valley would either be marshy or suffer from flooding. Obviously this had changed, and it's argued that in early Rome, the land was drained and the material taken from the sandy bars which had built up from flooding, this was used to level the area out. One existing feature, a long narrow raised strip of land, had additional material placed on top of it, and this was the predecessor for the spina, the long narrow middle of the racetrack. By draining the area to make it accessible, the Romans had created a flat piece of land with a raised central spine. Inadvertently, they had the basic structure which would be developed into the circus. This new area of land was swiftly made use of, as you might expect, and the earliest reference we have for the, for the area which became the circus occurred under the reign of Romulus, which, in a way, I suppose, suggests that this drainage occurred earlier, but again, it's Romulus, it's history, or is it just retrospectively placed there? If you cast your mind back to the time of Romulus, you remember the infamous moment with the Sabine women who were abducted at a festival. Well, the festival took place in this drained area, which suggests that it had an association with the games, festivals and the like. What's particularly interesting is that the festival in which the Sabine women were abducted wasn't just a random get-together. It was a celebration of Neptune as the patron of horses, and this would make perfect sense if the area already had races run there. But Livy also noted that it was called the Consualia, which was a very specific festival called for quite a unique deity. The poet Ovid, writing around the time of Augustus, recounted that the Consualia was a festival which celebrated Consus, the god of secret deliberations. He also seems to have an association with harvests and grain. And given that the Consualia was where Romulus ambushed the Sabines, and stole their unmarried women, it does seem to echo the theme of secrecy. Consus also had an altar in the circus, and this was either contained under one of the turning posts or within a chamber of it, and it was covered throughout the year and only uncovered at days of sacrifice to it. During the Consuelia, horses and mules were celebrated. They wore garlands and given the day off, though as they also had chariot races, presumably the Romans didn't think this as much work for the horses. And though it almost goes without saying that these origin stories need to be weighed outside of the mythic bubble, they exist in an area devoted to games and festivals in earlier Rome, which makes sense. In this instance, it's focused very much on equestrian sports, of which chariot racing was possibly the most exciting to watch. Given that the circus took its early form under Lucius, or at least the Tarquin kings, 
The Etruscan influence in all of this should be recognised. For example, Livy wrote that it was Etruscans who were the contestants in the earliest games, and these featured both horse racing and, interestingly, boxing. The involvement of chariots is curious, as chariots themselves aren't something you necessarily associate with Rome, but they were popular in Etruscan culture. In the context of what it looked like, the earliest form of the circus would be very much stripped bare of the glory and appeal which made Dionysus such an admirer. We're speculating, but it most likely would have been a narrow racing track marked out with the turning points or turning posts that I mentioned at each end. Seating was by allocation to the curia you belonged in, and these seats were formed of long planks raised at elevated levels. Along the middle of the track was the spine I previously talked about, and at this time it was free of the later wooden eggs and bronze dolphins, which indicated what lap number the chariots were on. It's also possible there would have been water in the form of narrow channels along the centre spine and the track itself. The likes of Suetonius and Dionysus both describe the channels, though it's not clear that they knew what their purpose originally was. Perhaps they thought them a more recent innovation. There's certainly a strong case that the channels acted to help drain the area, which even though reclaimed, still needed to be managed. And though the course slightly changed and the structures would have done as well, there would have still been that necessity to keep things from getting flooded. So you would have had, or possibly had, channels of water redirecting a stream or flood water out and away of the race course. The management of water and reclaiming land which involved Romans altering the topography of their own city wasn't just evident here. It was also the case for the second structure I'm going to talk about, and these are Rome's sewers. Trust me, it's much more interesting than it sounds. Dionysus' exaltation of the Roman sewer system was due to his understanding of it and possible observation as a figure living in the first century BCE. By the time of the imperial period, the Cloaca Maxima was the main sewer in Rome and was joined by various other sewers which fed into the Tiber. It was a large structure which sat under Rome and its main function was moving away surface water from the streets which accrued from rainwater and fountains. One thing the cloaca and sewers in Rome didn't generally do was cater for toilets or latrines. Connecting your toilet to the sewer would cost as well as requiring you to construct a mini connection yourself which invariably you'd be responsible for. In a niche but very interesting article on sanitation by Alex Scobie, there are a number of reasons why toilets in the imperial period, and therefore most likely before the imperial period, didn't link up with the sewers below. As mentioned, there was the cost. There was also no legal obligation to do so. As the Tiber often flooded, the effect of connecting your toilet to the sewer system might result in a very nasty problem if it all backed up. Then there was the danger. Roman sewers didn't have traps and dangerous gases could build up. No, no laughing at the back, please. Roman toilets were also often placed in or near the kitchen. So you might imagine a pocket of gas meeting a room with lit candles or lit flames. Even worse, the explosion happening in the sewer and surging back up. But these weren't the only occasions where toilets could act as an uncomfortable gateway. Rodents were a real problem in Rome, so connecting a latrine or toilet just gave the rats their own mini underground system to get into your house from. But rodents might not be the only animal a connected toilet might beckon into your home. Elian wrote of an instance in Darkechia, modern day Pozzuoli. It was here that a house was being used by Iberian merchants to store their cargo, which consisted of large vessels of pickled fish. One morning, the merchants unlocked the room where this was being stored and presumably where the latrine was or toilet. They were horrified to see that a large quantity of their cargo had been ransacked. Needless to say, they blamed each other, but there wasn't any obvious sign of entry. They couldn't find anything. There weren't any holes in the wall, nothing in the ceiling, and even the lock hadn't been broken. To catch the thief, one poor servant was selected, and he was asked to wait overnight, and even armed, in order to repel or stop the thief if he returned. And the thief did, and though... It wasn't armed in the obvious sense, it was very much in the other, because the thief was a large octopus, which had swum up the sewer and accessed what must have been a treasure trove for him through the toilet. The main function of the sewers in the imperial period, and indeed any time, was to remove street water from Rome, 
and it's fair to say that there was a large amount of this. Houses had drains from their roofs leading to the street, and just think of all those fountains. Plus, as I've mentioned, Rome was a hilly place and very prone to a spot of rain. The whole idea of a structure which took excess water and conducted it safely away wasn't a particularly new idea by the time Lucius started work on the sewers at Rome. Sewers had featured in Babylonia, Minoan Crete, and just to give Scotland a shout out, the village of Scoa Bray had drainage systems dating back to 3200 BCE. It was a known technology. Possibly what made Rome's different was that the sewers represented something much more than just an engineering feat. You see, in order to have sewers in the first place, Rome had to radically alter the topography of the city. To understand this, we can refer to a beautifully simple description of Rome in the 7th century CE from John N. N. Hopkins. I quote, Before the late kings, Rome's urban topography was defined by hills dotted with domestic architecture and a cluster of small public buildings overlooking a central, annually flooded basin. End quote. A good example of this is the area Lucius focused on, an area in a valley between the Capitoline and Palatine hills, which was to later become the Roman Forum. Here the land was 6.9 metres above sea level, which sounds a lot, except the annual floods raised the water there to up to 9 metres above sea level. The challenge for Lucius was to change that, and he did so by pushing workers to near breaking point, backfilling the area with earth and debris which brought it up to around 9 metres above sea level. The amount of material needed has been estimated at 20,000 cubic metres of soil. But it also included local stone and pottery and really anything the Romans could get their well-worked hands on. This gave Rome a space which it could now use, but there were still drainage problems. Streams and flooding were still a threat, and Lucius must have known that if this went unchecked, it would erode all the hard work in a heartbeat. The solution was a drainage canal, which took the waters coming in along possibly what was an existing stream or water route and out to the Tiber. As with the whole concept of sewers, this wasn't a new technology, and these existed elsewhere in Italy. Where Lucius went big was to abandon the common practice of a V-shaped or U-shaped channel. Instead, his channel was more square in cross-section, and he used stone as opposed to gravel and clay as had been used elsewhere. To help keep the sides from falling in, it's argued that planks of wood were placed across it at points, forming small walkways. According to Hopkins, the canal, and this is what it effectively was, a canal, was a metre wide and about the same in depth. Now, needless to say, there are alternative views which posit a slightly different arrangement, and even that the original structure wasn't open and it was closed. One even supposed that the drainage work undertaken to reclaim the area of the Circus Maximus provided the template to prove that this could be done elsewhere and employed here. So we've got an, almost a direct connection between the two. In whichever way you might want to look at it, the cloaca, or what it became, was a far less spectacular thing than what the likes of Pliny and Dionysus later swooned over. Perhaps the more impressive feat was the engineering to raise the level of the area in the first place. Hopkins suggested that this is why the canal or channel had the cut stone, to make it more spectacular as a statement. The use of stone also allowed that one additional bonus for us. It allowed the structure to be dated, and the oldest sections of the cloaca's wall gives us a date of around the 6th century BCE, which places it in or around where Lucius was in charge. It's not a definitive smoking gun, but it's certainly evidence that sits outside of a reference made by Dionysus or Livy. Sadly, much like sewers, Lucius came to a messy end, though not after he'd reigned for some time. Dionysus has him at 80 when he died, and Livy suggests that he reigned for around 38 years, which takes us up to around 579 BCE. If we take it then that Lucius was quite old when he died, we need to consider how that would have looked politically. The hope that any elderly king had was at least people would be patient for Mother Nature to take its course, and for the previous king this seems to have been the case. Lucius had just waited and then made his election bid once Ancus had died. And as I mentioned, in the course of this, he'd managed to sideline the sons of Ancus, and I mentioned then that they'd be back. Initially the sons sowed political discontent against the elderly king, and when this failed, they buried the hatchet, or at least pretended to. Then they waited for a bit, and then came back to bury the hatchet in a 
much more literal way. The sons hired a couple of shepherds or mercenaries dressed as shepherds and had them argue loudly outside the palace of the king. When things got too heated, Lucius came out and asked them to come inside so he could hear their case and adjudicate on it. The arguing carried on in front of the king, but it was all an act, and when the king was distracted, one of the men hit him in the head with an axe. This either killed him outright or mortally wounded him, and he died shortly after. Now, I can't say too much more about this simply because it oversteps into the next podcast, but what I want to do is briefly consider the motivations and machinations of those sons of Ancus, because it doesn't really balance particularly well as a cause and effect relationship. They were sidelined from the elections, and then they waited for 38 years, and then they assassinated him, or had him assassinated rather. It may well have been that they were just politically opportunistic, which wouldn't be the first time this has happened, particularly with the kings of Rome. After all, he was an elderly king. Perhaps they didn't want to miss out a second time and thought, well, let's just take advantage of the situation now. If the involvement of shepherds in a political assassination seems somehow familiar, then award yourself a point. Shepherds had previously been involved in an assassination of a king. When Romulus and Remus had avenged their grandfather, they'd employed shepherds to ambush the king Amulius so Numitor could take over. It seems that in antiquity, shepherds had a very different vibe to them. Definitely not the peaceful, chilled-out, easy guys you might think of in the modern times. The reign of Lucius has the paradox of unique aspects or elements to it, such as the Etruscan influence, but bound to often reheated or in some ways very familiar themes. That aside, he's presented to us as the first of an ongoing mini-story that isn't easily clipped into individual reigns, and in part that's because this is exactly what's going on. We're now with the Tarquin kings, and to pick up my earlier metaphor with the horror story, we're at a point now where the family find the remains of the family dog which went missing a few days ago, and start to wonder if little Billy is really such a sweet child, especially tied in with that weird voice he sometimes does. As ever, thanks very much for listening. If you want to say hello, I'm on Twitter, at Ancient Blogger, and you can find my ancient history content on ancientblogger.com. And by the way, I'm also on Instagram. The links are on my website, but you can just find me using Ancient Blogger. That's all one word. I usually sign off with a keep safe, stay well. And sadly, that seems very relevant at the moment. But seriously, Look after yourself out there and make sure you keep as safe and well as you can. Till next time, goodbye.